Revelation, I, 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 I'm going to give you some background to why um, it's one of my favourites. Revelation is, in fact, the most controversial book in the Bible, and I can remember years and years ago working at an Anglican manse off the Canning Highway, and it was a year or so after meeting Chuck Missler again the, for the second time in Perth in 1999. And by the time he had reached our city, and this was, you know, all the time he came to Perth, he was short of resources because he had sold them all over east. But when he reached our city, there were very slim pickings as to his resources left over. And I managed to buy two MP3 discs uh, on that second um, uh, visit. And one was Romans and one was Revelation. And I wore them both out. The discs eventually bubbled and I couldn't play them, but that was after a few years. Um, but I also bought a battery-powered MP3 disc player. I mean, I, th this is going back. You, th they were about that big. I don't know if you ever remember them. I don't know if you ever had one. But uh, they were battery-powered things and you clipped them onto your belt and you could play these MP3 discs. And so every day uh, that I was out working, I had my MP3 and my headphones and I played Revelation, uh, Revelation to death. Uh, and so that actually uh, really piqued the interest of the Anglican priest. And he asked me what I was listening to. And I said, a commentary on the book of Revelation. And this is what you often get from denominational churches. Not all of them, but most of them. And he said, he, uh, I've written here, he snorted and said contemptuously, oh, no, not that. You can make that book mean anything you want, which just goes to show that either he had never read it or he had never understood it. It is so plain uh, if you take it carefully. And I kind of stared at his receding bulk and just shook my head. It's exactly the opposite. If Genesis is the origin of all things, then Revelation is the summation of all things. And they, as a pair, are the magnificent bookends of the inspired word, word of God. And I think I've mentioned to you over the, uh, over the years that we've been together, I, I've mentioned to you a venerated 12th century rabbi called Maimonides, also known as the Rambam. If you go to a Jewish person and talk about Maimonides, they'll say, yes, the Rambam. That's an elevated uh, title to give um, a scholar. Who firstly deduced that the universe that God created existed in 10 dimensions just from careful exegesis of the 10 statements and God said in the first chapter and a half of Genesis. And don't forget, he did that by candle power in a room in Spain in the 12th century. And yet it took teams of particle physicists and supercomputers in the 20th century to come up with the same understanding, the string, the string theory. But of more interest to us today is that he was given a book <coughs> called the Apocalypsis, and having read it from end to end, more than once, he declared it a Jewish book and mandated that every Jew must read it. And I found that really interesting. And my desire in these messages from Revelation is to remove the confusion spawned by faulty exegesis and perverted by theological falsehood. My entire ministry is to simply tell you what the Bible says in the plainest understanding from the original languages. And I have had uh, in the past people come up to me and say, well, that's not what I've learned or that's not what I've heard before. And I'm, I, I will tell you again, if you don't understand or you don't agree, don't tell me you don't agree. Don't tell me it's a matter of interpretation because it's not. You, there is only ever one interpretation, correct interpretation of the Bible in its uh, original um, languages. Uh, so if you're going to try and uh, uh, debate with me, you show me. You show me. Don't give me your opinions or your prejudices or anything else. You show me where I'm wrong and I will be the first person to stand at this pul pulpit and say we'll change our view on it. Uh, good luck with that, but anyway. 
So let's go back to the exegesis of Revelation 4. And after these things, and that's a, a technical phrase, it's always a marker. It's used as a change of theme or a scene in 36 verses of the Bible. It's amazing. There are 15 of uses, uses of this phrase in the Old Testament and 21 in the New Testament. And in this book, in Revelation, it's used eight times to change focus or scene or a consequence of things that have gone before. And it's an enigmatic statement because when you look deeper into it, 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 just a flood of things come up. As in chapter 1, Jesus was appearing from heaven, uh, heaven and standing before John on Patmos among the seven golden lampstands and holding the seven stars in his hand. And we had that image last week. And then John took dictation from Jesus covering chapters 2 and 3, giving a report card on each of the seven churches, which are not only real churches at that time, but in the order that they are recorded, they seem to be prophetic of the development of the church age. Have you seen on YouTube some of the absolute blasphemies coming out from the pulpit these days? Like in the German Lutheran church, God is queer. Have you heard that? Yeah, you're all, you've seen that video. I mean, I, I hate even saying that. I'm expecting a lighting, lightning bolt any time for saying that from behind the pulpit. And the other thing is that uh, some, some lady priest in America said that he, she was giving a doxology to God who is a non-binary um, being. Uh, look, it's just getting worse and worse and worse. They're getting more aggressive and the things that you and I have to do is to hold on to this book and the truth that's in the book and the promises and the prophecies in this book. And, you know, the amazing thing is all of that, the fact that he comes down to, to, to John and he's standing amongst the seven golden lampstands, that's the seven churches, and he's holding the, the stars, the seven stars in his right hand. And that's the consequence that is the consequence of the first century national rejection of Jesus as the Messiah of Israel. And therefore, in the plan of God, a new entity was created called the church, of which Jesus is the head. So the first chapter validates the church always being in the eternal plan of God. The rejection of Jesus was always part of the um, plan of God. And here I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And you know what? Uh, whenever I exegete, I have a look at the verbs and I have a look at the, uh, the adjectives. There's a door standing open in heaven. And it's powerful if you look carefully at that statement. Heavens, and as I said last week, open to humans on earth is not a new thing. And I, I gave you references last week. I'm going to give you a couple of verses um, that, that you know, build on that. Isaiah recorded his vision of the throne of God in chapter 6. And it says in 6, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, and be careful, it's lowercase, L-O-R-D, lowercase. So who is that in the Hebrew? That's Adonai. And Isaiah, a human being on the earth, saw him. And I told you last week, and we're going to repeat it again, that Timothy, sorry, Paul writing to Timothy in 6, uh, 15 and 16 says that God dwells in inapproachable light and no human eyes can see him or will ever see him. In our carnality, we cannot perceive the perfection of God. And so he saw Jesus first uh, the, the, his, as the son of God, sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above it, above the throne stood, what? Seraphim. And each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, and I like the, the commentary on this, as they are unworthy to gaze at God, with two he covered his feet, not worthy to stand in the presence of almighty God, and with two he flew, always ready to serve. And one seraphim cried to another seraphim and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. 
And I love this. I absolutely love this. The start of verse 4. And the posts of the what? The door is nothing new in the New Testament. There it is in Isaiah, there. The door into heaven. And that's really important when we get to uh, the further verses. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house, which is the throne room, was filled with smoke. The seraphim are as best can be deduced as amongst the mightiest of angels, and they stand above the throne to define the holy space of the throne of God and his holiness. They never leave that position. And Ezekiel saw an intricate vision of heaven in chapter 1. And, and I think I've told you before, but I, lo- I just love this, uh, because my son, after he listened to me preach one day, he said, Dad, how can I you know, get into the Bible like you get into the Bible? And I said, do the 24 hours uh, uh, the Bible in 24 Hours by Chuck Missler. Uh, anyone done that? Everyone has seen it? Well done. Good. Um, I'll elevate you to mighty people within the congregation. <laughs> but anyway, um, so he did it. But I can always remember, he'd sent me a text during about 10 or 10.30 uh, one morning, and he said, Dad, he said, I've just finished Ezekiel chapter 1, and he had an emoji, and the eyes were going like this. <laughs> and I don't blame him. I don't blame him. E- Ezekiel 1 is very, very difficult, but it, you can get through it. But Ezekiel saw this, uh, this vision in chapter 1. It was similar to John, but Ezekiel saw different angels in heaven. And these are the cherubim, and of the same order of mighty angels, but it appears that they move within creation to serve the purposes of God, but also associate with and protect the presence of God amongst the humanity as in the two cherub who stood either side of the flaming sword at the perimeter of the Garden of Eden to prevent anyone re-entering that lost paradise. But it's clearer in chapter 10, which involves the severe judgment of Jerusalem and the Judean people prior to and within the Babylonian invasion of the city and the province. And I can always remember, I think it was um, either early this year or late last year, Chris, that... uh, was part of our congregation but is now in Tasmania and she asked me, Stuart, I'm trying to understand how God actually left the temple in the Old Testament times and if you read Ezekiel chapter 8, you'll get the sins of the people, the appalling things that they were up to and 9 and 10 is the staged removal of the glory of God from the, uh, from the temple. And so I'm going to read you just a, a very short um, um, uh, three verses to this is part of it and Ezekiel 10 verses 18 to 20 and then the glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim and the cherubim lifted their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight and when they went out the wheels were beside them and they stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. This is the living creature that I saw under the, under the God of Israel by the river Hebar, and I knew that they were cherubim. So uh, Ezekiel's um, vision of heaven uh, involved the, the cherubim. And the interesting thing there is in verse 19, and when they went out, the wheels were beside them. And I tell you what, I chugged and chugged and chugged and chugged for years when I first came to this way back in the 90s, early 90s, and I was thinking to myself, what on earth the wheels? And some commentators, seriously, they have to force something into something to make them satisfied with this. And so they say that God's got a stationary throne and he's got a chariot throne. And the chariot throne's got wheels on it. And I'm, I've got a real problem with that. I mean, uh, I laugh now when we get photos of our um, six-month-old grandson because Sue and I bought him one of these things that you can seat a little baby in and they've got a frame around them with wheels on it and their little feet can, you know, run around the house. And I'm sort of thinking that's what reminds me, this of me. But uh, my very erudite searching wife was reading 
um, uh, some literature uh, related to a messianic rabbi in the first century. And he was dealing with this, this whole thing, the wheels uh, in, in heaven. And if you picture a wheel from end on, it looks like a wheel. But if you turn it around, it's slightly different. And this rabbi was teaching this young disciple that the wheels, and I'm not telling you this is doctrine, but this makes more sense to me, that they are the Torah scrolls of Torah. Do you get it? I can't imagine God having a throne with little wheels on it. I just can't. He doesn't need to go anywhere. He's omnipresent. Anyway, I, I, so I, I've... I just park that with you because wheels give me a break, seriously. And in the New Testament, the heavens were opened at the baptism of Jesus, like I said, in, Luke, in Matthew 3 and Luke 3, and at the opening of the stoning of Stephen in Acts 7, and Acts 10, when Peter saw the vision of the clean and unclean an animals. And by the way, most of your modern translations will have that the sheet with the unclean animals on it came down from the sky that's wrong in the greek it's actually heaven and that annoys me and in revelation 19 when all the tribes of the earth see jesus the king of kings and lord of lords riding a horse towards the earth accompanied by two armies angels and you and i the bride of christ and john is still on patmos looking up and what he sees is a door open. The proper translation, they've got the, the, the verb tense wrong there, is the, the proper translation is a door having been opened. And that's a promise set before the Philadelphian church, which is important to understand given what Jesus, uh, John sees in the throne room of God. Many critics of the preaching of Revelation say, where's the application? It's all spook stuff. It's all this marvellous sort of things where things come down from heaven, kill hundreds of thousands of people and all the rest of it. Where's the application? I'll give you application. The door of heaven and to heaven is not only open, but it is only, you're listening, it's only opened by Jesus. It's only opened by Jesus as when he told the Philadelphian church that he had the key of David and only he opens and no one can shut and he shuts and no one can open. Do you understand? Whenever you see uh, a, a, an action taken, I always think when I'm doing the study and the exegesis, I say, well, so what is the opposite to this? What's the, if the opposite is exactly true, then what you've read is exactly true because the exact opposite should mirror the exact um, premise. And that really reminded me, and the parable of the ten virgins, and virgins is, is a shocking translation. It should be, the, uh, in the cultural context, bridesmaids. And Jesus took the five wise into the kingdom and refused entry to the five foolish. So what happened to the foolish? Well, I'm sorry, but they went to hell. Jesus said to them, depart from me, I never knew you. There's a, a, a very nice person here. I won't identify gender, but they are very nice. They've been watching us at the start of the year on YouTube and they started coming to the church. And they said, Stuart, uh, you're one of the few pastors in Perth or anywhere who will ever say the word hell. Well, if you don't, you're a coward and you shouldn't stand behind this because if you lull people into the um, situation where they think there are no consequences for sin, you are going to be held responsible from behind the pulpit when you go up there. And I, 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 I listen, when I do messages like this, I'm very aware of what I say, and Jesus has got notes of it, of everything I've ever said from behind the pulpit. And don't ever forget that. Depart from me, I never knew you. The glorious majesty of John's record of the throne room of God should make believers excited to be there one day. How many are waiting to be there tomorrow? Yeah, that's good. You're Calvary Chapel people. But there is the opposite. 
If we go up there through the open door, opened by Jesus, and we go, I look at the opposite. What happens when someone dies and they open their eyes and they're in in the other place? Imagine the horror. Imagine the horror. And they can't get out. And it's all because they rejected the plan of their salvation given by God the Father through God the Son. John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. Now look at the next three words. Except what? Why would he not say in me or by me? What does he say through? Because entry into heaven is through Jesus. Even in John chapter 9, he's, uh, John 10 verse 9, he says, I am the door of the, of the uh, sheepfold. And the first verse, which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things. And this is the same voice that spoke to John in, John in chapter 1, verse 10 onwards. It was the voice of Jesus. And it's Jesus, by the way, who issues the command for the saints to leave the earth, as I demonstrated last week in the Thessalonians passage. And verse 2, immediately I was in the spirit, and there's a, some documentary argument about that, but I'm not going to go in there. And behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on it. See, they can't even describe it because carnal eyes cannot see him, the Father. And too many commentators say that what happened to John is symbolic of the rapture of the church. It is not. As the rapture is the receipt of our resurrection, eternal perfect bodies, and then the the commencement of our at least seven years of being washed by the word of God, as Paul points out in Ephesians and in in, uh, 1 Corinthians, prepared as the spotless bride of Christ and then, and then to be examined by the beamer seat judgment of Jesus to receive our crown rewards. And the first crown that everyone should get in my estimation is the crown of righteousness. And what's the crown of righteousness for? Because you've believed in Jesus Christ. And you ain't going to get to heaven unless you've done that. So at least everyone's got um, uh, one crown. Note, note that the 24 elders are already seated on thrones around the Father's throne and wearing crowns as evidence that the rapture took place in the past and that the perfect spotless rewarded bride sits already in the presence of God. And I'll give you another application that you should be able to tie into this. Ephesians 2, just 4 to 8. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, and this is God the Father, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, And verse 6, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What are the verb tenses in those verses? Come on, Jimmy. They're all past tense. As far as God is concerned, you're already up there because there's no time in eternity Do you understand? That's why when John, 1900 years ago, went up, looked into eternity, and he saw the elders sitting around the throne. And some of you weren't paying attention. I can... can, No, up there, not here. And raised us up and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. You didn't deserve to go up there. It's God's grace, love, and mercy that he poured out on all of us that we get up there. Don't ever think that you deserved it. I know I certainly didn't. 
What John describes here in chapters 4 and 5 is our destiny. And this is the application for every one of us here, that we're going to be up there seated around the throne. And then from 6 to 19, it's the wrath of God upon a rebellious, wicked world within which God redeems those who already have their names in the Lamb's Book of Life. You know, I, I've, uh, I was... I've stopped watching 98% of the stuff on YouTube regarding prophecy because I'm sick and tired of it. I've heard it again and again and again. And all they do is say the same thing using different words. But I had, uh, I had to smile at an interesting one uh, at the early of the week. It just caught my attention because there was a short clip on it on the, on the YouTube. And I thought, oh, I'll have a look. And it was... Um, uh, it was Tom Hughes and Brandon Holthouse. And they were saying, uh, we estimate that there's no more than 2% of the human uh, race are going to go up in the rapture. And I sort of started doing the numbers. And I thought, well, listen, I don't even believe the 8 billion. Why would you believe 8 billion? All right? I just don't believe it because those numbers are being inflated by the people who want to justify killing us. Do you understand? And, and the fascinating thing is, um, a few years ago when Sue and I went down and had a, 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 um, a holiday at Albany, we left Armadale, and five hours later we got to Albany, and as we were driving through wheat field after wheat field after wheat field, Sue said to me, gosh, isn't the planet just overpopulated? <laughs> Seriously? And on my, on my screen savers, on my computer, I've got these beautiful um, um, uh, photographs, but they're all, all in Alaska and Scandinavia and Russia and all the rest of it. You can't see a person anywhere. We're all stuck in cities, and they want us there because that's where we're easy to control and irradiate. And if we're all sneezing and coughing over each other, that's the perfect place to make us sick. But at the end of the day, um, uh, seriously, I, 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 I challenge that, but if you do your own numbers on 2% going up in the, in the uh, rapture, I thought that was a... A, it's unsub unsubstantiated, and uh, it said things, they say things like that to their audience to try and get them to be desperate enough to listen to the next one to see if they're the part of the 2%. Give me a break. Seriously, if you're going up, your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life from before the foundation of this earth, you know. You don't have to worry about what a YouTube prophecy expert says about you. Amen. Verse 3, and he who was sitting like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald. This is the Father who is likened to a jasper stone, which in modern understanding is the purest form of a diamond possible. Have you ever had a look at diamonds and then held them up to the light and you see the refraction of all the constituents of light? It's absolutely amazing. In a diamond or even a cheaper cut of glass, you can see the spectrum of light, the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and indigo, violet. This is the simplest visual explanation a human can give of Almighty God. We're trying to use human language to describe the glory of God, and it's virtually impo uh, impossible. Look at 1 Timothy 6, and I've only got two verses this time, which he... God, the Father, will bring about at the proper time he who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in what? Unapproachable light, who no man has seen or can see, and to, be, uh, to him be honour and eternal dominion. Uh, amen. And I think in John 1.18, it, always, it already says that uh, no one can see uh, God the Father. And so it's right through the, the, the scriptures. So if ever, ever you see, see one of the things that when I looked at the images uh, and dozens and dozens and dozens of images of God the Father sitting on the throne, they'd have this sort of glowing um, uh, light, but they had a human form. 
sitting on the throne. Well, listen, you cannot coalesce and reduce Almighty God into human form. That's what Jesus did for us in Ephesians 2, 11 and 12. Uh, he gave up his glory and took on the likeness of human flesh to die on the cross for your sins and mine, to be buried and rose again on the third day, and that is why we are going up, because you have put your faith in him. God the Father dwells in unapproachable light, and human eyes and human intellect cannot see or even conceive of the true glory of our God. So what John and you and I see is the pure source of light, which is the Father. Aligned with this light is also a rainbow around the throne, reminding us all of the Genesis 9 scene where God promises Noah never destroy humanity again with a flood. And he, God, gives Noah as a sign and a token of that covenantal promise, the sign of the rainbow. We've had lots of opportunities lately to see rainbows. Have you noticed that? And every time I look out our bedroom windows and I look over the city and the, the mist is coming up from the south, I see a rainbow and I said, that's God's promise. And it really is. It will never, ever uh, be a flood that destroys humanity. Uh, and we'll get further into that in, in, as we get into Revelation. Therefore, to see a rainbow around the throne is to understand the God, that God the Father is a covenant-keeping, promise-keeping God. Uh, and the emerald hue is a source of much conjectures. It's one of the um, colours in the, uh, breast of the breastplate of the high priest. But in verse 4, it says, And around the throne, oh, I can't wait to get this, this is brilliant, 24 th thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their head. In all of chapter 4, no other verse invokes more controversy than this one. And I don't know why. Because I don't want to spoil next week's uh, message, but that exactly explains who they are. But the, the, the commentary, I've got 38 commentators on this book just because I like reading them. And boy, some of them are strange. Some of them are very good, some of them are really strange. Uh, and opinions of these 24 elders, and by the way, they're 24, and, and the speculation is that when David had so many priests on his hands, he, in 1 Chronic uh, Chronicles 24, divided the priesthood up into 24 different courses. Do you understand? And so each course had a turn, and then when they had had their turn, it went to the next course and then to the next course. And if you are really sharp and your memory is still wor uh, working, when Zacharias, the father of the future John the Baptist, was standing in the um, uh, temple about to put the incense onto the altar, uh, he was called a priest of the course of Abijah. Well done. Okay, give the man a chocolate so that he's up there. <laughs> um, but that's one of the courses. Do you understand? And there were... 24 courses, and by the time that uh, Jesus was uh, ministering in the first century, there were so many priests within the 24 courses that in that course you had to take a ticket and to see if your lucky number was on that number, and that was the only way you could ever do service in the temple, and because there were so many priests, it was likely that you would only ever do it once in your lifetime. And I like that. Why? Because that's why God arranged Zacharias to be in the temple that day doing that service because he sent Gabriel down to give him a message that as we don't care, um, uh, Zacharias, you're far beyond um, childbearing age and so is your wife, Elizabeth, but we've got news for you. Uh, and so they had uh, John the Baptist. Um, who are these 24 elders? Opinions range from angels or as yet never described beings of indeterminate status like no one knows. The Old Testament prophets, prophets no, or half 
the church representatives and the 12 apostles together, 12 and 12, or they are representatives of the church. And reputable commentary from decent men start to say this. It cannot be angels, and I agree with this, they're not angels, that's you and I, by the way, but let's get uh, these things out of the way because it's sloppy exegesis. Angels never wear crowns, nor do they sit on thrones, and they are never redeemed as the elect angels never sinned and the demonic horde of fallen angels can never be redeemed. And may I put my own estimation on this statement. I agree that there is absolutely no record of a crowned or redeemed angel. However, there is the sticky issue of one fallen one called Lucifer, who was of the order of the cherubim, who rebelled and took apparently one third of the angelic realm with him. And that's only stated in Matthew, uh, Revelation 12, by the way. But there is a verse in Isaiah that causes me to pause and consider. And this is the iniquity that was found in Lucifer's heart in Ezekiel 28. And that's why he was kicked out of heaven. Isaiah 14, 13 and 14. For you have said in your heart, look, angels have hearts. They have emotions. They have intelligence. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt what? My throne. The wheel's grinding. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. That's the elect angelic realm. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north and I will ascend above the heights of the clouds which is the Shekinah glory and I will be like the Most High. That's the deal that he sold to Eve in the garden. If you just eat of this fruit, your eyes will be opened, and you'll know the difference between good and evil, and you will be like God. And we've got these people whose headquarters is in Davos, Switzerland, who consider themselves gods. And they consider their uh, right to kill us, to depopulate Mother Earth, to save the environment because of all of the global warming. Everyone's sweating at, in the last couple of months. I have never known it so cold. I, I looked up um, bombs at the other day because Sue and I were like this in bed. We had the sheets right, the blanket right up to here. And even our faces were cold. And I looked at the bomb and I looked at the temperature over in our daughter's place in Belmont. It was 0 0.2. And it, Belmont's always cold and hot in the winter and summer anyway. And ours was 2.6. I have never had it so cold. Never. I mean, I know there's been, you know, uh, the odd time, but no. no. Global warming, give me a break. Martin Armstrong has got a 3,500 year um, chart of the uh, heating and warming uh, trends in human history. And the Russians did massive drilling projects in uh, Siberia, going down deeper than anyone else's do, look, and taking core, diamond core out of the ground and looking at it and, and, and detecting when it was either hot or cold because of the, um, the, uh, the, the, what's left over in those particular uh, layers. And so the, the, the earth has always been um, warming and, and cooling. And in the warm periods, economies have thrived because trade has flourished. And in the cold um, um, at, at the times, uh, uh, um, sickness, uh, plagues and everything else have, have um, uh, decimated the populations. And it's absolutely fascinating. Do you know that in the 12th century they had dairy farms in Iceland? Do you know that? 
dairy farms in Iceland because they've still got the, the um, farm infrastructure there for holding the cattle. And if you were lucky on a particular day, there was a, um, a land bridge between, I think, the, north of, uh, the top of Norway through to either Greenland or Iceland, I can't remember, and they could walk it there because of the heat of the, of the, the hottest part of the cycle. So there are cycles and, and the earth does get warm, but it also gets cold. And I think at the moment it's cold. And, and you know, isn't that God's sense of humour when they're saying beware of global warming and everyone's shivering? Give me a break. So this is uh, what Isaiah records in, in Lucifer's heart. And he becomes Satan. So he says, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. So that's not doctrine. It's just cause of refl to reflect on it. And there's another passage in Revelation 13, 1 to 3. And in verse 1 it says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and there's a lot of argument about the eye. It should have been um, Satan stood on the sand of the sea because of the uh, precedent um, noun. And I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. This goes back to the imagery in Daniel. And what Daniel showed us was the lion first, then the bear, then the leopard. Why is the order changed around? Because we're looking back on that time. And they were all different um, uh, empires. And you know what? One of, the, one of my favourite uh, commentators, who was C.I. Schofield, he was saying, someone said, yes, yeah, that's right. He is very good. I picked up one f flaw, though, but we might have an argument about that up in heaven, but he is very, very good. But um, he is uh, very, very clear on, on this particular thing. Uh, and he said, you've got to take this seriously. Uh, and we went through the leopard and the, uh, the bear and the lion, and the dragon, which is Satan, because he's described that way in, in the previous chapter, chapter 12, gave him, who, the beast, his power, and what? His what? Oh, you haven't got it. His throne. His throne and great authority. And verse 3, And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. And you see, that's another um, um, literary device that um, excludes the reality, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. The, all, all the world m did not marvel and follow the beast because at the end of the seven-year tribulation, there's two judgments, the sheep and goat judgments of the Gentiles and the judgment of the Jews. And there are believers who are both saved out of those judgments. Do you understand? So as much as um, these uh, evil people at the moment think that they've got technological superiority over us, we have God over us. Do you understand? And at the end of the seven-year tribulation, where I assume there's even more technology suppressing the people, there are still believers that make it through the system. Why? Because their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm not forcing doctrine in this area. Please don't say, oh, he taught that that's absolute. I just find it absolutely fascinating. When a commentator says they never sit on thrones, well, what do you do with that? I'm not forcing doctrine, and I totally reject the concept that these 24 could be angels, but I'm somewhat annoyed at times when commentary does not take in the whole counsel of God. Uh, for instance, there is a comment uh, in, in the paperwork that I've got that angels never sit in the presence of God. So I'm going to show you Daniel 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael shall what? So when I see something like that, I say, in order for him to stand up, he must have been sitting down. 
And that's something that a commentator just totally ignores. All right? And this is uh, Daniel 12. Uh, this, the last part of Daniel 11 is all the first about the, uh, the first three and a half years of the tribulation. But at, this is right at the time of the abomination of desolation when the beast who's been uh, resurrected from the abyss and he kills the two uh, witnesses in Jerusalem and he goes into the Holy of Holies and declares himself as God. And so Daniel 12 starts and it says, and at that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time and at that time your people shall be delivered and here's the one that you should always notice. Everyone who is found written in the book. And if you take anything else from this message is that your name is written in a book in heaven. Praise God for that. Anyone had a bad day this week? I, I, I had one. It should have been rubbed out. But anyway, it's it, because of God's grace and mer mercy. I totally reject the concept of elders being angels, but I've given uh, far more clarity uh, for that than careless sweeping statements. Some of the other possibilities put forward. And number two is it's ridiculous. They call it the mysterious co uh, contingent. Well, that's the first and last time I've ever read it from Genesis to Revelation. And, and this is what some people do. They have to have an answer to a question that they don't know the answer to. So they make something up. It's called the mysterious contingent. And I just say it's ridiculous. I'm not even going to bother with that. Number three, they th say it could be the Old Testament saints. Well, why could it not be the Old Testament saints? See, what we all forget is that Revelation is a sequence. Chapter one, Jesus coming down from heaven, showing uh, John that he holds the uh, seven stars in his hand and he walks amongst the churches. Chapter 2 was the churches and their performance and prophetically right up to the end of this time. Then we look up into heaven, then we get uh, chapter 6 and it's the beginning of the wrath of God because in verse 17 of chapter 6, it, the people who are getting uh, punished by God say, hide us in these uh, cleaves of the rocks and protect us from the wrath of God, not only him, but the lamb who sits beside him. And, you know, it's fascinating that unbelievers could describe God that way, and I'm not going to go any further because I think that whole chapter 6 is absolutely amazing. So Old Testament saints can't be. They're out of the question. As they haven't yet been resurrected, they must await the commencement of the millennial kingdom for their res resurrection bodies, which is in... Uh, Revelation 21 and 2. Now, some say the apostles. They are the members of the body of Christ, and it could be some of them, but there's no backup to prove it. As far as I'm concerned, they can only be representatives of the church who are the only redeemed, resurrected saints at the end of the church age and before the seven-year tribulation, and more certainly before the millennial kingdom. Uh, by the way, they could be you. You ever thought of that? Sharon? Any? Max? It could be you. How do you know that you're not? Talk about application. We're up there. Do you understand? These 24 individuals are called elders specifically or in the Greek Presbyterius and are mentioned in the King James Bible 67 times and always of older, reputable men of faith in both the Old Testament Israel and in the New Testament church but never of angels. Presbyterius are never of angels. Listen, it is so ludicrous to ascribe the term elder to an angel. Why? Because they don't age. From the instant they were created, they're still 
the same now. Do you understand? As a, a, as a contrast, we look in the mirror every morning and saying, oh, it's getting worse and worse and worse. You see, angels dwell in eternity. They don't age. There's no time in eternity. Uh, there was one guy that said something ridiculous, but um, Sue likes him, so I'm not going to say anything because I'll, I'll get a flea in my ear on the way home. <laughs> there is no time in eternity. How can there be time in eternity? Time is a, 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 is a measure of decay. How, eternity doesn't decay. As far as God's concerned, we're already up there. So what do you worry about? Seriously, what do you ever really worry about if you're already up there? Talk about application. I'll give you application. <laughs> and verse 5, out from the throne comes flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And once again, it's enigmatic. It could possibly be idiomatic, these flashes of lightning and the sounds of peals of thunder. Uh, uh, it's either God's power and glory or it's a portent of coming divine fury, which it is about to be unleashed on an unbelieving world. And just as an example, I've got Exodus 9.23 here. Um, and in Exodus 9.23, it says this, and Moses stretched out his rod toward heaven and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire darted to the ground. And then the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. So there is a um, possibility that, that these things coming out of God's th throne at this time is a portent to what's going to happen in 6 to 19. And once again, the, sem the seven lamp stands, stands as standing in heaven when previously the seven lamp stands were on the earth as churches and they do represent the church. And it's more proof, if you want it, of the translation of the church saints into the throne room of God. And verse 6, And before the throne there was something like the sea of glass, like crystal, in the centre and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes, and in front and behind. And these are the cherubim that stand east, west, north, and south of God's throne, depicting the omniscience, the omnipotence, and the omnipresence of God. The four here in this image above is, oh, that's the one that we had last week, is one having a face of a lion, the face of an ox, the other having the face of a man, and the last is having the face of an eagle. And we learnt last week that that is uh, the four Gospels. And verse 7 says, The first creature was like a lion, and the second creature like a calf, and the third, it, by the way, that should be ox, not calf. And the third creature had a face like that of a man, and the fourth creature was a flying eagle. Redolent of the four Gospels, Jesus, Jesus as the lion of uh, the tribe of, Jews, of Judah in Matthew, uh, Mark rep represents Jesus as the servant of Jehovah because he was writing to um, Rome and Rome were only interested in either the, uh, the overlords or the servants. And Jesus as the servant of Jehovah, and you'll find that in uh, Isaiah 52, 13 to 15, where God says, behold my servant, and it turns out to be Jesus as the servant of Jehovah, uh, the sent one of the Father to do the Father's will on earth. And the Gospel of John is full of Jesus saying, he sent me, I came down, he sent me, he's the servant of Jehovah. Luke portrays the humanity of Jesus as the God-man who knew the sufferings and travail of mankind. And John presented Jesus as the divine one who created the universe and gave life and light to men. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, 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 the Lord Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And that is his eternality. And the four living creatures appear to be, once again, not doctrine, but it's just uh, my... Um, consideration that these four living creatures with this kind of worship 
appear to be the replacement for Lucifer who originally led the worship of God before he fell and was cast out of heaven. And they are like Lucifer, are in the highest ranks of angels, being cherubim. And we got 9, 10 and 11. And when the living creatures gave glory and honour and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, that's his eternality, then in, chapter, in verse 10, the 24 elders will fall down before him, that's you and I, before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honour and power. And you know what? It, it does your heart and your soul and your spirit really a great deal when you read these three verses. I haven't finished there yet on verse 11. Because can you imagine being in the throne room of God, looking at the throne seeing Jesus, seeing the seraphim, seeing the cherubim, seeing the archangels, seeing the angels. And to think that we made it up there. Even now I say to myself, Lord, how did you save me? I wasn't necessarily a bad person, but I was a very um, selfish person. I was a very aggressive person. None of you would know that by, uh, by my behaviour behind the pulpit, but I wasn't. I, I, it was me, 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 and, and I, just, I just bulldozed a path before me. Uh, and uh, I got a text from um, a lovely person in our uh, congregation, and he sent me something by David Jeremiah. And uh, it was about... Um, people in the Old Testament dealing with their lives and their struggles and everything else like that. And uh, I, re I responded and I simply said, I um, relate mostly to Abraham because Abraham was born and raised in Mesopotamia between the two rivers in Chaldea. And that was paradise in those days. Do you understand? Lush pasture, uh, plenty of money, everything. And his father, Terah, by um, insinuation, was a maker of uh, um, pagan idols and that was a very good, um, uh, profitable thing to be in. But Abraham grew up there and at the age of 75, all of a sudden, someone appeared up there and said, get out of there. And can you imagine uh, Abraham? Get out of here. Where are you going to take me? I'm not telling you. It's to a land that I will take you to and show you. So Abraham with his father and the family, they made it up to Haran. Terah died at the age of 205 and they crossed which river? The Euphrates. That's the bottom river. The Tigris is the top river. The, the, the um, Euphrates. And to cross the river, what have I said you get called? The word Hebrew. The meaning of Hebrew is one who crosses the river. So down into Canaan they went and Abraham ended up in the uh, highlands of uh, high country of Judah, almost like a, a desert. And, uh, and there he found God. There he found God not in Mesopotamia, in the desert. And I left one of the most beautiful places in the whole world and landed in the desert of Western Australia. <laughs> and there I found God. And there I found God. And it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. And, you know... Um, Someone came up to me just before saying, um, you know, I'm very, very annoyed at my uh, son because he's not listening to my advice. Yeah, think. <laughs> at the end of the day, what you will remember 
is the wise counsel your parents gave you and you ignored for a period of time. And you, and I said to, to the, the congregant, I said, I would have had such an easier life if I had just listened to dad. But I look back and I see that I left beauty, got dumped in a desert and I found God and that's all I've ever wanted and all I've ever needed. These three verses conclude and they describe the format of heavenly worship which you and I will take part in in a time which is so much closer than you and I can even imagine. So close, so close. It's just amazing. That's the application. This is all about not them. This is all about you. Do you understand? You're seated around the throne already. So walk worthy for that blessing from your Father in heaven. Father, we just thank you from the bottom of our hearts. In fact, thanking you just isn't enough, Father. We fall on our knees and in awe we look up at you, Father. All we see is your radiant purity, your majesty, your holiness, your righteousness, your truthfulness, Father. And we see Jesus seated at your right hand, Father. And we see around your throne the mighty angels who define you and uh, serve you, Father. And Father, I pray that we all take that to heart, Father. And we, we serve you because you first loved us. And Father, fill us with that understanding of your love for us, sending us your son to this earth to take on the likeness of human flesh, to take every sin that we have ever committed upon his body on that cross 2,000 years ago, Father. And because of that, you will grant us, us, the body of Christ, the royal priesthood, the privilege to sit around your throne for eternity, Father. And all God's people said,